Thanks, Tim, and thanks for inviting me. And uh, hello, everybody. I uh, hope you're going to enjoy this evening. Uh, by the way, Tim, well done on getting the pronunciation right on Aconcagua, because uh, plenty of people struggle with that. Uh, so, good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about Aconcagua again, exploring the strength within. Okay, so this was me a couple of years ago, January the 18th, 2018. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon, and at this point I was in a pretty bad way. Um, we'd been trekking for nine hours from five o'clock in the morning, and uh, it was absolutely freezing, it was minus 40. I hadn't felt my feet for over five hours, and frostbite was a very real concern at this particular time. At the same time, I was completely exhausted and suffering with severe altitude sickness. However, I wasn't in so much of a bad way that I couldn't take a selfie for the Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> An hour later, I was about 150 metres from the summit and things were going from bad to worse. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'd felt a shift in my body. I was struggling to control my bowels and I noticed that I'd got a tingling sensation in my hands and in my feet and uh, I started to hallucinate. And I started to get a voice in my head over and over again. Matt, you haven't got this today. You need to turn around and get back down. As I began to lose control of my legs, I realised I was done and I needed to get down and lose altitude quickly. <clears throat> At the time, fortunately, I recognised I was coming down with the early stages of cerebral edema, which is a swelling of the brain caused by high altitude and potentially fatal. The next seven hours, were absolutely terrifying for me. I was hanging on to life and every ounce of my being wanted to lie down in the snow and sleep forever. But there was a part of me that just wanted to live and re recognised I'd got too much living to do and I needed to get down. And so after seven hours, I eventually made it back down to base camp, rested for a few days and then successfully got off the mountain. Uh, when I got back to Mendoza, I was counting my lucky stars and I realised that every cloud has a silver lining in so much as, yes, I hadn't made the summit, but I had come down and managed to survive with my life. But moreover, I'd lost seven kilos in 12 days, and it was the best <laughs> diet I've ever done. <laughs> okay, so here she is, Aconcagua, absolutely beautiful. She stands at 6,962 meters, and is a high altitude mountain. She's in South America and is the highest mountain in the world outside of the Himalayas. Uh, she's also one of the seven summits. Uh, many people attempt to climb her each year, roughly in the region of about 40,000, because she is a non-technical mountain. And what that basically means is that you can trek to the top, even in the snow that all you need on is some crampons and an ice axe. However, because of that fact alone, many people do perish on her around about nine to 15 every year. And the reasons for that is because uh, she tends to exhibit incredibly high winds, absolutely brutal freezing cold temperatures at the top, and also severe altitude at the same time. And there's roughly about a 30% success rate on everybody who tries to get to the top of the mountain. The uh, cloud formation that you can see at the top there, this was when I arrived this year. Uh, basically what that means is that at the top, uh, it's absolutely raging with high winds and absolutely freezing cold temperatures and snowing. So Whenever it's like that, as beautiful as it looks, it's a completely different experience at the top and nobody was summiting for the weeks before we got there. <coughs> okay, I'm the kind of person who likes a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and in my role as a PT, personal trainer, coach and mentor, this is one of my favorite quotes. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. <coughs> Um, in 2018, I attempted the mountain self-supported. What that meant was I did it with a couple of friends of mine and we had absolutely zero support of any mountain logistics when we were on there. This time around, I decided to do things differently and in June 2019, I booked with a team called Elite Himalayan Adventures, which are a crack team of world record holding Sherpas, some of the very best in the world at what they do. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I, got, I allowed myself six months to prepare as fully as possible uh, for the expedition I had, and that required a few bits and pieces being done differently from last time. 
the first thing was the kit. And his last time I'd gone vastly undergunned with the equipment I'd got, which is one of the reasons why I was lucky to escape without frostbite on the first attempt. This time over on the right hand side there, you can see that very sexy pair of boots I'm wearing on the treadmill. <laughs> Those are 8,000 meter summit boots, triple layer, plastic, very heavy. Uh, and they allow you to get to the top of mountains like Everest and hopefully retain your feet. So with Sack and Kagu being just under 7,000 metres, they were just up for the job and hopefully uh, that would strive off any risk of frostbite. So it took me quite a while to accrue the kit. It's all very expensive stuff. In addition uh, was the training. I had a completely different approach. Last time I was incredibly fit cardiovascularly, but I'd spend next to no time at altitude. This time around, I managed to secure a place with Brighton University and I was in their altitude chamber between one and three times a week in the five weeks before I went out on that treadmill there for between one and three hours. It was boring as hell. <laughs> However, at 4,500 metres, it was exactly what I needed and it was uh, the altitude that's just below the height of Mont Blanc and spending time at that altitude just allowed me to put my body in the best possible position in order to acclimatise quicker once I got out to Argentina. In addition to the altitude chamber sessions, I also hired an altitude tent from the altitude centre Covent Garden. And that was uh, a great thing to do as well. Again, it was for the five weeks before I headed out on the expedition. And um, basically that amounts to having a generator near to your bed that sounds like a building site. And then a plastic cover over your bed so it feels like you're sleeping in a crisp packet. <laughs> anyway, sleep was hard to come by but it did seem to help and I noticed my fitness improving dramatically with the altitude training that I was doing even at sea level. Okay, so it's just off the screen there, but uh, 5th of January I landed in Mendoza, Argentina. By the 7th of January, I was trekking from Penitentes, which is the ski resort at the trailhead of Aconcagua, trekking the 16 miles to base camp, Plaza de Mules, with an overnight stop in Camp 1, which is Camp Confluencia. Um, the trek from Confluencia to base camp is known as the second hardest day of the expedition, straight after the summit day, because ultimately you're trekking for eight hours and gaining around about 800 metres of elevation, which is a fair amount at altitude in one day. <coughs> so in terms of what it feels like to gradually trek from 2,500 metres to 4,300, is in the past I've noticed headaches, nausea, fatigue and obviously increased breathing rates as well. This time around I absolutely noticed nothing at all and so I arrived in base camp feeling pretty much normal with, that, with zero side effects whatsoever. On arriving in base camp after sorting your gear out there's a few main jobs to do. The main ones are to rest, to acclimatise, to eat and hydrate. Now, uh, I thought I'd keep things current. So here I am in base camp, taking hydration very seriously and enjoying a few coronas. But uh, in all seriousness, uh, hydration at base camp is massively important because when you're at altitude, you expel a lot more air just through breathing and with that leaves your body as moisture. And so dehydration is a massive problem on the mountain. Um, it's recommended that you drink between four and five litres a day of fluid which is a lot of water. But the problem is at uh, Aconcagua Base Camp is this, is all of the water uh, comes directly off the glacier. And the mountain teams who are, at, who are based at Base Camp who look after you, they treat the water, but the water's got an absolutely incredibly high mineral content. And it is the very best laxative known to man. <laughs> uh, within eight hours of being at Base Camp, I'd got Base Camp belly. Uh, and imagine if you can this, the worst long drop toilets in the world, sharing a base camp with a thousand people, all in the same boat as you, it's faecal carnage. <laughs> it's also a real mental test. Fortunately, it was exactly the same when I was out there two years ago, and so I knew, I knew what to expect. But of the other 15 team members who were with me, for some of those it was the first time, and it was a real mental struggle having to go and face what you had to face every day, multiple times a day. Okay, so this is a picture of us climbing uh, from uh, base camp to camp one. It's absolutely beautiful, mind-blowing vastness that we get immersed in. 
And um, as you climb up from base camp, you've got three camps that are basically uh, progressively higher. You've got Camp Canada, 5,050 metres, Camp Nido, which is 5,500 metres, and uh, Camp Calera, 6,000 metres before you then push on for the summit. Now the strategy in order to acclimatise is to progressively trek higher to allow your body to adapt to the diminishing oxygen levels that happen as you increase the altitude. Generally speaking, around about 500 metres per day maximum is what's recommended in order to try and avoid any uh, altitude-based sickness. So what's it like at high altitude? It's pure hardship and it's like living in slow motion. The simplest of tasks become hard. Just getting dressed in the morning to get your clothes on has you out of breath. Bending over to put your boots on has you out of breath and it's like running a 10k without moving any distance at all. It's difficult to sleep because one of the things that happens as you get progressively higher on the mountain is you can wake up in the night gasping for breath which is quite unsettling if you've never had that before and eventually it settles down and you can eventually get back to sleep again. But on average you're looking at around about four hours sleep a night if you're lucky and on the higher camps you're sleeping on a mattress that's a centimetre thick of foam on rock so it's pretty uncomfortable as well. Uh, you have a lot of time while you're acclimatised in base camp as well. We spent many days in base camp this year waiting for a weather window and so of course with that time you've got plenty of time to contemplate what lies ahead which can send you into a little bit of uh, mental uh, skew whiff as well just waiting. Okay, so on the 11th of January, our expedition leader, Nims Dye, announced that we were going to be heading for the summit on the 16th of Jan, and a weather window had emerged after weeks and weeks of people not summiting because of the weather at the top. The plan was simple. We were going to leave base camp on the 14th of Jan and head up to Camp 1 and spend a night sleeping. On the 15th, we were going to get up, take the four-hour trek to Camp 2, and then rest for a few hours. We were going to completely skip out Camp 3 and dash straight for the summit in one quick bid. It was an ambitious and incredibly aggressive summit push, and I'm not going to lie, it was one that made me incredibly nervous. What was making me nervous was the fact that I was looking at gaining around about 2,600 metres of elevation within 48 hours. So if you think that the recommended is 500 metres per day, it was a massive stretch. Now before this point we'd only had one acclimatisation trek up to Camp 1 and the rest of the time we'd been resting in base camp. So none of us had been up to Camp 2 or above and so it was a real concern as to how our bodies were going to feel at the higher elevations. Uh, this is a picture of me at the front leading the group and there's a group of Sherpas behind me. Uh, on my back there is about 22 kilos of gear and the pace that we're going at is agonisingly slow, less than one mile an hour and yet you're burning up to 800 calories an hour because of the effort. It's absolutely savage. And in that moment, what happens, or what happened to me, is the mindset of questioning whether you can do it, whether you can withstand it. Every single step is absolutely agony, and the top is so far away, it feels like you might never get there. But it's just a process of really trying to manage your emotions, trying to bring yourself back into the present moment and let go of any tension that you might have about your ability to succeed at the top and just to focus on taking one step and then the next and then the next and just trying to be as relaxed as possible as you go. So I eventually got into camp two about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, 5,500 metres and that was the first time I experienced any symptoms of altitude sickness and it came across as a mild headache and a definite loss in appetite. We rested for a few hours and then the summit bid began on the 15th and which was we set off at 11 p.m. in the in the night and in my team was a, a girl called Carly, a lad called Phil and two Sherpas, Django and Lakpa. The other teams are going to be setting off an hour later than us. Anyway, as we set off uh, into the pitch black, it was absolutely freezing cold. But within an hour, I was absolutely dying because of the pace. And the Sherpas had set the pace way too high. And so I was doubting myself and questioning whether I'd be able to do it and whether, I was, uh, whether the others were suffering as much as me. After enduring that for about an hour, I decided to speak out and I spoke to Phil and Carly. And seemingly they'd been in exactly the same boat, but hadn't been speaking about it either. So we had a team meeting with the Sherpas and we all agreed that we were going to slow the pace down 
And I knew at this point, by slowing the pace down, I was way more likely to manage to reach the summit. It's really a mental process of... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I lost myself. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so a really mental process of being completely self-aware and just um, completely managing yourself. Uh, Try to move as efficiently as possible and doing the absolute minimum to take one step followed by the next and no more than that. Okay, so this picture of uh, me on the left here was the exact spot that I was when it was two years ago, snowy, and I was in a very different position. The fact that there's no snow there means what you're faced with this time around is an absolutely <coughs> massive scree slope. <coughs> At this altitude, uh, just to the right off the picture there, there's a cave which is a known resting point. And we rested in that cave for around about 20 minutes before the final push. At this altitude, about 6,600 metres, the urge to sleep is absolutely overwhelming. Bear in mind that by now it was around about 9 o'clock in the morning, and we'd been going on the, on the go from 11pm the previous night, trekking all the way through the night. <coughs> Every time I closed my eyes for a second, it was like my, I could feel myself being dragged into sleep, and just this warm blackness where I wanted to be and yet you can't allow yourself to go there. You have to keep on pushing. As I was climbing up the scree slope, just off the picture to the right, you end up taking five steps forward and around about 10 to 15 breaths, like I am in the right-hand picture there. That is pretty much the state that you find yourself in after just taking five steps to get higher and higher as you go. Um, I found myself wanting the suffering to end, just wanting it to stop. But what I wanted more was to stand on the top. I passed the section where two years ago I'd had to turn around and was completely over, overwhelmed with emotion. I remembered the panic I was feeling and the fear in my body of the potential of not getting back down again and seeing my friends, my family, my son. <coughs> this time around I still had the headache, I was still feeling sick, I was still hallucinating. But I knew things were different because I knew I could make it to the top if I just kept taking one step after the next. So there I am on the right hand side, just taking the final few agonising steps, steps to the top. And on the 10th, uh, 16th of January, 10am, I managed to summit the highest mountain outside of the Himalayas with Carly and Phil there in the left hand picture, my teammates. Carly was incredible on this. She started to suffer with pretty bad altitude sickness on the way up. She was overheating. Uh, she started being sick after about an hour. She was sick another eight times on the way to the top. So it was absolutely brutal. Um, but when we got to the top, and as I sat next to the cross there, flying the flag of Paramonte, the Adam Savory Memorial Fund, which is a local charity to try and raise uh, awareness about the dangers of altitude sickness, I was elated. I was exhausted. I was overwhelmed by the scenery and I was completely overcome with emotion. It was absolutely beautiful. And it was a very real, surreal, it was a very surreal experience having failed the previous two years. So I stayed on the summit for around about half an hour, just resting and waiting for the, other, for the remainder of the team to come up. And then of course, the summit's only halfway. And so you then have to reach deep down inside yourself when you're totally exhausted and then get down and retrace your steps in exactly the same way. I'd run out of water and I'd run out of food. What I wanted was somehow to magically be transported back out down to camp two. The way, what lay ahead was hours and hours of descending over loose and steep scree. My body was shot, my legs were hardly working and I was completely exhausted and I fell over more times than I can remember on the way down. Many times it just felt hopeless, and I remember just sitting in the scree, just waiting and passing time, just hoping that something would happen for me to find myself in Camp 2, but it wasn't happening. <laughs> At 4pm, I eventually rolled into Camp 2, and I was totally spent. Uh, I sat for a rock in a state of limbo, just looking at the sun, waiting for it to go down, and I eventually came to my senses. I remember looking up at the summit and thinking only hours ago I'd been stood up there myself, and how good it felt. I'd overcome all, all adversity uh, to complete a challenge that previously two years had set out to do. 
And I remember smiling to myself, content with the effort I'd put in, and knew in that I didn't have to go back out and challenge and take on Akin Kagua again. Mm -hmm.